And Chelsea, I will let you take it away. Okay, awesome. Uh, thank you for having me again, Liz. This is super exciting. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, welcome everyone to You Can Draw This with me, Chelsea Kirchhoff. I am a freelance illustrator um, based out of Detroit, Michigan. Well, the Metro Detroit area. I went to school in downtown Detroit at the College for Creative Studies, um, where I got a BFA in fine arts with a, a, a focus in illustration. Um, when I'm not drawing, uh, I do a lot of uh, youth classes. I run a summer art camp. And so art really is my life. And it's something that I'm really excited to work with um, people of all ages, because it's not just kids. Um, I've run programs with adults. I do one-on-one -on -one lessons. And when it comes to something like you can draw this, uh, I think it's so important regardless of your age to choose to spend the hour with me. You know, you could be doing anything right now, but you're sitting down to make time to create. And I think that's one of the greatest things that we as people can do. Um, there's a really great quote by Pablo Picasso. And it says that every child is an artist. It's just remembering how to be one when we grow up. And I find that to be one of the greatest quotes because when we are young, one of the first things that we do is pick up a crayon and we make scribbles on a page. Um, and as we get older, you know, maybe in middle school or high school, you found yourself, you know, I don't know, daydreaming during a lecture and you start doodling in the margins of your notebook. Um, it's something that creativity is something that we always go back to. And so, whether this is your first time drawing in decades, days, weeks, um, if this is something you do regular, regularly, I still think that drawing um, with different people, you're gonna learn something new every time, even if it's something that you already know how to do, because I think that each person has a very individual and unique approach to art. And so having said that about Pablo Picasso, there's one other thing I wanna say before we get started, and it's that I want you to throw the idea of perfection out the window because we're people, nothing that we do is perfect and it never will be. The fact that you're going to be holding, you know, a pencil or a pen and putting it to paper to make something, the human element as people, we are imperfect beings. And so I want you to think I can do this because you can, I promise you, you can. And forget about trying to make this perfect or finished or polished. This is simply creation for creation's sake. We're getting together, we're sitting down, we're gonna make something together. And I just want you to enjoy the process of doing it and try to turn off that internal voice um, just for the duration of this class, if you're able to. And so having said that, actually one last thing, I'm gonna be drawing on an iPad, which you can see on the screen, um, you can draw this. The thing that I'm drawing with is actually a 6B pencil so I want every move that I make for you to be able to see it and see that I'm using a pencil um, just like you or I'm, pen still works. But, um, and this way you can see every single thing that I'm doing. This will not be one of those step one and you see a circle, step two, it's finished. No, it's not gonna be like that. You're gonna be with me every step of the way. I wanna make sure that you are comfortable with what we're doing. And so having said that, I'll stop talking about talking and we'll get into the drawing, all right? And like Liz said, if you have any questions, please feel free. Um, you can say them aloud or please utilize the chat. I'm happy to answer any and all questions. Okay, here we go. So the very first thing that I love to do whenever I'm sitting down to draw is a warm up. And so I'm gonna teach you, um, we're gonna do a step-by-step -step quick draw. And then we're also gonna do a little art game. And then we'll jump into sort of the technical side of art. But the very first thing that I would like you to do is I would like you to join me in drawing um, a square or it could be a rectangle, just that sort of shape. And again, as you can see, not a perfect shape, doesn't matter. I think that's one of the hardest things is especially if you haven't drawn in a while, you feel like, oh no. I haven't drawn in years. How am I gonna do this? Just like me, one stroke at a time. Okay, now from there, what I would like you to do is we're going to make a series of triangles along the top here. 
and you don't want them to go down super far. You just want to go from left to right. Because like I said, this is just like a fun little follow along to loosen you up. Okay, and once you've done that, I would love it if you would fill those in. And you could do it quickly. It doesn't even have to stay in there or you can really take your time with it. Make sure that you're covering up all of those white spaces. I just did one of each so you can see. And I'll just kind of keep going across. Can you? Uh, sorry? Yeah, I just joined. Um, I'm a little confused on what we're doing. Oh, that's okay. We're doing um, just a quick follow along warm up sketch. Okay. So all you got to do is draw a triangle or not a triangle, a rectangle or a square for our base. And then we added in as many triangles as you can fit across the top there. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. And you, this is still very early. Don't worry. This is, we didn't get very far. Okay. Once you have that, you might be wondering where this is going. I think it's going to get a little bit more obvious. Uh, we're going to go just about halfway down. I would like you to draw a long rectangle like this, a long skinny rectangle. And you can also color that in. So again, I'm just kind of doing it quickly so you can see it doesn't have to be perfect. All right, from there, we're going to do two long U's. So you're going to jump from one side to the next with your U's. Once you do that, I'd love it if you could put two circles in the middle. Start to take shape. After that, please join me in doing a small little rectangle in between. Then, this is where we're going to do a couple of long stretchy lines. We're going to go from the corner of that little rectangle and do a line down to that bottom left. You're gonna mirror that same thing on the right. Okay. And now we're gonna do what I love to do, which is called an arched line, a jump line, if you will. We're gonna go from the le bottom left corner and we're gonna do an arch that goes to that right. Almost done here. We're gonna go halfway down. We are going to do a C and on the opposite side, a backward C. Just have a couple more things to do. We're gonna go down here near the bottom. We're gonna make a little rectangle. And then on the end of that rectangle, we're gonna add another little rectangle. I think you can see where this is going. It's starting to take shape. And on that bottom right side, we are going to mirror that and do the exact same thing. And then for detail, we're gonna anywhere where you want on the face. I'd love it if you could do a couple little scars. And so they can, and I'll do this one just right here. It doesn't even matter. You can do it wherever you see fit. And then if you're feeling extra, Excited about detail. Just a little like a little lightning bolt. No wrong way to do it. And there we have a fun little Frankenstein. <laughs> and the thing that I love about doing this step by step really quickly is because this was super simple, right? It's just, it's a variety of shapes and lines. And it's inspired by this really great artist um, that believed that anybody could draw named Ed Emberley. And Ed Emberley has a ton of how-to books. I'm gonna write his name down really quickly. Ed Emberley. And so this was inspired by him. He's got a fun one on Halloween characters and Frankenstein just always stuck out to me because I love the simplicity of it. And so this is a great way to start as a warm up. And does anybody have any questions about Frankenstein? Okay, awesome. Then I'm gonna jump on in to our next little warm-up game. And for this, you can do it on the same sheet if you have room, 
or um, just below it. You can start on another sheet if you want, whatever you're comfortable with. I would love it if you could just make four random blobs. Anything, just, just some blobby shapes. Okay, now, one of the most important things when we sit down to draw is we wanna make sure that our brains are working in tandem with our hands. Because whatever we want to do, we generally, we can see it in our heads a lot of the time before we do it. And the problem is getting it to translate from our head to our hand. And so something like this is gonna kind of get those creativity cells moving around in your brain and help you wake it up. All right, so this is the blob game. And I love the blob game. The blob game is similar to if you're driving around, you look up the clouds. Sometimes you can see shapes or animals I don't know, you could see weird pictures that no one else can see. And so what I want you to do is look at these blobs and see what you can make them into. And you're like, whoa, hang on, Chelsea, that's a lot, okay? We just did a step-by-step. -step. Need you to slow it down. Listen, you got this, believe me. If I'm looking at these blobs, my blobs, because obviously every, everyone's blobs are gonna look really different. I could go the very simple route here and maybe this first one is a flower. All right, that, that's pretty easy. But this next one to the right of it, well, you know what? This could be a little, I don't know, person, I guess. And Maybe he's shaped a little irregularly, but that's okay. Everybody's different. We all have different shapes. You know, maybe, I don't know, put some little arms on here. And these are his fun pants and shoes. And then, I don't know, maybe this, maybe this next one might be a little boogie and ghost. So it looks like he's kind of dancing. <laughs> but maybe I'm just making him look like he's in pain. That that could work too. Give him some lines. There's a little ghost. And then I'll throw a little shadow underneath to make it look like he's kind of floating. And, you know, I could add little music notes. So then at least he's attempting to look like he's dancing. And I don't know, this bottom one kind of looks like a bird or a dinosaur. And some little teeth. And so the blob game is kind of weird, but it's also really cool because you can do this a hundred different times and you're gonna get completely different images results i mean it's really all in what you see and as you can see you don't even need to be limited by what you can or can't draw because this is all just coming from your head you've got all those great ideas up there and every time you do this you're going to get better at it you're going to be able to connect what you're seeing in your head to your hand and produce it on paper every single time it's going to get better and better you know, art is, uh, it's, it's like anything, you know, uh, Liz, you said you want to learn how to sew, you know, I, I can't expect, I don't know how to sew. <laughs> I'm terrible at it. I can do very basic things, but if you looked at the inside and saw all the thread, you'd be like, how did we get from A to B? How did you even close this hole? Um, and that's because I don't have a lot of practice in it. You know, if I sat down every day and made 10 minutes to sew, by the end of the month, I'm going to have a lot of time under my belt. Don't ask me to do math. I'm not a math person. But the same goes for art. And if you were to set aside 10 minutes a day just to make time to draw, you're just going to get better and better at it. It's one of those things if you haven't done it in a while. Yeah, it's not going to look how you want it to look exactly. But you still took something and put it on a white sheet of paper that had nothing there before. 
And that to me is really powerful and cool. And so this is our blob game. Any questions about the blob game? I mean, that's just one of very many games. You know, there's a bunch of different things that you can do. And if you don't like games, you can always draw out patterns, whatever you want to do before you jump into doing something more final, I guess, will really help you. Okay. So now we're going to get into some of the technical side of drawing. And so if everybody could get out a plain sheet of paper and join me, like I said, if this is stuff that you've already heard of or done before, that's okay. It doesn't hurt to go over these terms, techniques, um, and practice together. Because like I said, there's room for you to learn something new, no matter what you do. Okay. We're going to learn about one of the most important things in art. And that is contour lines. Contour lines are used to make something look or appear as if it is not flat. And you might be thinking, well, how are we going to do that? I'm going to show you. What I would love everybody to do is draw two cylinders like this. Think about it like a breadstick. That's what I like to say. Sometimes, you know, the technical terms get me. If I imagine I'm drawing a breadstick, I know what those look like. Pass me a breadstick, please. And it doesn't have to be super big because um, we're going to just do, this is going to be a little example of how important contour lines are and how they kind of change what we're looking at. Okay, in your left cylinder breadstick, I would love it if you would do straight lines. So we're gonna go from left to right and you don't need a ruler. They can be straight-ish, as I say, they don't have to be perfectly straight. I'm just kind of eyeballing it and just going from one side to the next. And you wanna to try to keep them equidistant. You know, obviously I'm not being, uh, I'm not measuring it. I'm just doing it as I go down. So if you have a little bit more spacing, that's okay. There's no wrong way to do this. Okay, and once you have that, we're going to jump over to our other breadstick where we're going to introduce contour lines. And so the way that this works is in, instead of going from left to right with a straight line, I would like you to go from left to right with an arched line. So like a little rainbow from one side to the next. And you want to make sure that you're, you're really jumping from one side to the next. It doesn't have to be a super severe arch. You know, it can be subtle, but we want to make sure that we can see that arch line. And the same thing, you want to try to keep this equidistant, equidistantly spaced, I guess. And we're just going from one side to the next. Take it slow. Really make sure you're feeling that arch. And once you do that, looking at these two breadsticks side by side, the one with the straight lines is a flat object with straight lines through it. But when you take an, a line and make it wrap around an object, you are changing the way that we're viewing this drawing. Because that breadstick is now not just a flat image, that looks like it's 3D because of those curved lines. You know, if I were to ask you right now to hold up your finger and use your finger to wrap around it, it's not going to go straight across. If you really want to show off what this finger looks like, you would wrap all the way around it. And that is one of the really cool things about line and how we can use it to fool our eyes to make something look 3D. And so I'm going to have you do a circle. This one doesn't have to be big either. It's going to be part of the same sort of exercise. And I would like you to do contour lines from the left side to the right. Again, we're arching just so that way you have a better grasp and understanding when using a different shape.
And then if you really want to blow someone's mind, where those lines end, you could add on straight lines like this. And you can do it on both sides if you want. Remember straight-ish because I'm just kind of eyeballing this. You can use a ruler if you want to get it exact. A ruler will make it look a little more crisp. It's all on what you're going for. And now this really looks like it's popping off of the surface. Because when you have those straight lines continue on either side of it, this almost looks like a teardrop shape with lines over it. And another really cool thing that you can do is if you want to come from the opposite way, and this is me just doing the straight line, arching, coming down, straight line, arching, coming down. And I'm doing that over the entire surface. And it can help if you want to turn your paper instead of just doing it straight up and down like me. But then that really takes this into the 3D world by making it look like there's a little bit of a grid over this very flat circle that we initially drew. You know, this was a flat circle that now looks like a 3D image just by adding some lines. Like it's one of the coolest things ever. The power of the line cannot be overstated here. And again, and you don't have to do this one. I'm just gonna do it really quickly on the side while people are finishing up. But if I did those lines coming in both ways, just straight, look at the difference that that makes just doing flat straight lines versus the curved contour lines. It reads completely differently. And so that's why this is one of the most important things in art. And it's important to start out with because now we're gonna talk a little bit about shading and how contour lines can actually help us when it comes to shading. All right, so I'm just gonna zoom that out a little bit. And now I'm gonna actually move this over really quickly. So it's all over here. Cool. Okay, and now what we're going to get into is a little bit of shading. And so what I would love for you to do is join me, please, in drawing a circle. And it doesn't have to be a big circle. Um, it could be about like a, a bottle cap size. So if you can visualize that, it, it kind of gives you the ballpark of the size, at least, because I know sometimes people want to draw a circle on the whole sheet of paper. And I don't want you to spend too long on this one. Okay, and then the first shading technique that I'm going to show you is contour shading. And so this is going to play off of um, what we did. And another name for this is also patching. And so the way that this works, let me give you a real quick rundown about shading if you've never done it before. Shading is what we use to make something look more realistic. When it comes to shading, we need, in order for there to be shadows or dark areas on a piece of art, we have to imagine that it has a light source. So let's just imagine that this little circle here is a ball on a sidewalk. If I go up here into the top right side, I'm going to draw a little baby sun. And that sun is going to be shining down on this ball. Where the light from that sun hits the ball, which is right around this area, that's going to be getting direct light. Like right now, I'm sitting underneath a lamp. That lamp is illuminating my face, right? Makes sense. That's simple. Well, if you were to draw me, you would see that my face is light, but under here where my neck is, I've got a shadow. There's a little bit of a shadow because the light's hitting my face and is causing the underside of my chin to cast a shadow down onto my neck. And the same thing can be said about this ball. We've got the shading or the light coming in from the top right. And so we know that there's gonna be a shadow on the bottom left. And with that in mind, I'm gonna tell you a little bit how we do hatching or contour shading. So what we want to do is create darkness down here in the bottom 
left and light or lightness, keep it consistent on that top right. So the way that we would do this shading is you wanna have your lines all going in the same direction. And so you can follow along with me. All of my lines are starting out from the bottom left, going up to the top, but you see they're not completely crossing over into that lightness section, right? It doesn't go all the way to the edge. You got a little bit in there, but not a lot. The next thing that I'm gonna do is go in the same direction and add more lines. And the most important thing with this particular type of shading is that we're keeping our lines consistently going in the same direction while building up the darkness in this bottom left right section. And you don't want to go all the way up. Each time you do it, you want to make it so that way they get a little thinner height wise. So you see, I'm just building this up so that way the dark area is where I want that darkness. And all of my lines, I'm just layering them. I'm going over them until I get the level of darkness that I want. And if we have the top right with a bright light, then that bottom left has to have a dark, dark. It's about balance. All right. And take your time with this, you know, build it up as much as you want. The harder you press, you're going to get a nice dark line. But anytime you get near the light area, you really want to use your pencil or pen almost as if it's a feather and very lightly. And you might think, oh, I was pressing down hard the whole time. That's OK. I'm going to teach you another shading technique where you can still mess with the pressure of your instrument. All right. And then if you really want to sell this, you can do a little shadow. And I'm going all, you want to still do it one direction underneath here. I'm just going from one side to the next. So that looks as if it's actually sitting on a surface. Because that's the thing, when we add shadows onto something, it's no longer an object floating in space. Now we've actually cemented this in reality. And that's one of the coolest things about throwing just a little shadow underneath. It changes everything. And anyone that looks at this will think, whoa, this person knows what they're doing. And even if you don't, that's okay. Fake it till you make it. All right. And then shading, it can be very um, overwhelming. And it can also take a super long time. So don't feel bad if you're like, whoa, you just did that very fast, Chelsea. Because I would tell you, hey, it's not a rush. It never is. Especially with art, it is definitely a marathon. It is not a sprint. You know, it's one of those things, the longer you spend on it, obviously, the more developed, the more refined and defined it will be. If you rush it, it's going to look a little rushed, but it'll also have a nice energy about it. And that's why I say there's no wrong way to do this. So keep that in mind. And please don't compare yourself to anybody, especially me. You know, I, I've, I'm coming in, th this is all, I, I do this stuff all the time. And so, you know, if you're like, wow, she just did that so quickly. Never compare yourself to anyone because comparison is the thief of joy. I definitely don't want anybody feeling like they're not good enough. Okay. I know some people are still finishing up their hatching contour shading. We're going to do another circle and I'm going to teach you another shading technique. And this one can be around the same size. And this one is going to be cross hatching. Same thing. I want you to imagine that that sun is still in that same spot. And you can draw the sun if you want. I'm going to just draw it so you have it as a reference point on mine. Cross hatching is really fun because I know that, especially with just general hatching, our impulse is to just like go all over and back and forth. And so to really like control your hand and make it say, no, we're all going in one direction here. That's when you obviously want to defy that. Cross hatching is where you get to do it. And so 
I'm going to come in and I'm going to start with my lines all in that same direction. And then cross hatching is cool because you get to come in from any direction you want to build up those darks. So you're still relying on lines, but they could be crisscross. They can come in from the bottom to the top. You can do any angle you want. You want to turn your paper upside down and do it. That's fine. You're just building up all of these different lines until you're getting the darkness that you want. And it's cross hatching because every time that you do a new line, it's going to cross over the line that you previously had. And so it's super cool because this is where you're like, okay, yeah, this is way less controlled. I love that. And so this is another way that you can do it. And again, if I want to come down here and just go make a little cross hatch shadow, you know, coming from any angle, long ways, up and down, however I want to. You're going to get a nice little shadow down there in that same hatching style. People are going to lose their minds. Okay. And don't worry, I know I'm throwing a bunch of different hat or shading um, techniques at you, but don't worry if I'm going a little fast. I just want to make sure that I'm able to show you these different techniques before we jump on to kind of tying it all together. I'm going to draw another circle. And this one is called stippling. Again, I'm going to draw a little sun. And I also want to say, because someone might be thinking this, um, why do you keep putting the sun in the same direction or position? And I. To that I say just for consistency. If you want to move this sun all the way over here, I'm just gonna show you really quickly, that would make that light spot here. And then my shadow would be on this side. So there's no wrong way to do it. Like I said, it's just for consistency. Um, sorry, I just saw. Um, oh yeah, someone else telling the class was, I put one hour, is that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we get, we'll probably go, you know, cause we didn't start until, um, 35. So we'll go until 35 if that's yeah. Okay. And then how do I feel about erasing? Go ahead and erase. Like I said, no wrong way to do this. I always like to kind of mess with it. Um, if I really mess something up, I will erase it, but if I can work around it, I'll just leave it. You know, in the words of Bob Ross, I'm all about a happy accident and turning something uh, turning what might be a negative to someone, like if you look at someone, you're like, whoa, I, I made too many marks. Roll with it. There's no one telling you that it's wrong or right. You know, the more you do it, the more you'll understand what you're doing. And so I say roll with the punches. But I will say this, when it comes to shading, if you feel like you went way too dark, um, you know, halfway up or even near the light part, go ahead and erase that and then redo your shading. Because you can always go dark, but you can't go light again. So it's really good to be more reserved with your shading and build up that darkness, build up those layers in the dark area, as opposed to just jumping in like a bull in a china shop and like, I'm doing it, I'm doing it dark. Because like I said, it's really hard to come back from that once you've made it very dark. But if you do do that, you can say, all right, I learned from this, try it again or erase it and then just rebuild it. All right, stippling. This is one of my favorite techniques in the world, but it is the most time consuming. So I'm going to show it to you. We'll talk about it. Some of you might already know it. It also goes by the name of pointillism. And that is literally dots. It's shading with dots. And the only way to do this is patiently. Because if you start pressing down and you're not making actual dots, you're gonna end up doing this which are weird marks and not dots. So I'm erasing those real quick. I know I said I never erased, but this is just, I had to for this. Don't, don't judge me for it. But this is where you do dots. And I'm talking hundreds of dots. I once did a, a project in dots, uh, an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper uh, of, an of an image completely covered in dots. And it took me two and a half weeks, spending like five hours a day on it. Um, so it's a lot. 
but it is a very cool technique and it's used by a lot of different artists. Um, there's a really great painting in the Art Institute of Chicago by Surratt of, it's like an afternoon in the park. And it's um, one of the, it's the famous painting that you see in the movie, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Uh, Cameron's having a stare off with this painting in the movie. And it, it gets closer and closer to the painting and the entire painting, it's, it's gigantic. Um, it, it's just, the whole image is just dots. Um, Chelsea, we had a question from someone. They said, what is the other name for the shading? So you called it stippling and then there's pointillism. Is there another name? Um, I don't think so. I feel like I'm gonna spell pointillism wrong. I know there's like an extra L or T something in here. So don't judge me. I'm usually very good about spelling, but that is the the rough spelling. Don't worry, Google will be sure to tell you. Did you mean this? Yes, I did. <laughs> and so with pointillism or stippling, the closer that you get to that light area, the farther your dots will be apart. And as you're down here in that very dark area, you're gonna be putting them on top of each other, very close together, bridging that gap, closing it up so you see less white space. And so this is a real game of patience. And it also gives you the opportunity to sort of correct if you feel like you're going too dark because you're not doing gigantic strokes with your pen or your pencil. You're really making uh, deliberate and you point either but this is one that i highly recommend you coming back to because you really have so much more control over this shading technique than you do any other one all right and there's one final shading technique i'm going to show you oh also you could do shadow with the dots so that's just really quickly down there um the very last one so you're going to draw a little circle i'll put the sun for reference that's kind of a crazy sun but that's okay is called scumbling. And I love it. I just love that word because it sounds like something a pirate would say, scumbling. And scumbling is really cool because there's no rhyme or reason to it. And so the way scumbling works, let me do a, for the lightness, you're just gonna put your pencil down and you are going to do a series of swirling circles. So it's like, I'm doing it in slow motion to show you. Um, I'm just swirling, swirling, swirling. But if I'm doing this fast, it's just gonna be like this. Just a tornado of swirls. And it's, you're just circling. You're circling on top of each other. And again, trying to build up that darkness down there in the bottom left. And did I get a little too dark? Yeah, maybe. But that's okay. And um, then, oh, oh. Okay. I was going to say, we do have a quick question in the chat. It said, yeah. sometimes, sometime during this class, can you talk about lighting? I found yeah. that during stippling, my hand caused a shadow on the paper. Should your light be overhead or off to your side behind you? As in, so I guess they mean like lighting as in like the light that you're using in the room. Yeah, absolutely. I can totally, yeah. Um, so yeah, and then I just did my little scumble shadow. So yeah, I'll say this. Um, you can move your, your light source can be anywhere where you want it to be on your paper because you are dictating it. Unless you set up an actual still life in front of you where you know like you're putting an object in front of you and you're putting a lamp or a flashlight, something above or around it to create your deliberate light source. The art world is your, that's your oyster. So if you want to, and I'll just um, do a little circle here and you know, I'll put the sun, I don't know, down here. If you're lighting something from down there, but it's still sitting on a surface, you'll have it very dark up here, but you're not gonna have that shadow down at the bottom. There might be a slight shadow, but it's not gonna stretch or be as dark as what we've been doing. And if you do accidentally um, like rub your hand, cause especially if you're using pencil, listen, that I'm famous for having my whole hand covered in lead. Don't be afraid to go in there with your, your eraser just to pull some of it up. 
because the more that your hand spreads across something, like if you're dragging it while you're drawing, you're gonna end up taking any of that shading that you've done and kind of evening it out, giving you a nice middle tone. But if it gets into your light area, that's gonna turn that sort of like a medium gray. Because if we're looking at things as very dark and very light, in the middle, it's a series of grays. And so same thing with the light source though. If you wanna move it to the top, then you're just gonna have, you just have to adjust. And wherever you have light, the opposite side has to be dark. And you can even push the shadow back a little bit. Okay, I hope that answered some of it. Um, if it didn't, feel free to jump back in the chat, make it more specific, or not more specific, but tell me if I missed something. All right, so these are our different techniques for shading. Any questions about that? Now, listen, I know the, te the technical side of art, it's not the most fun, but it's necessary, especially if we wanna put it all together and apply it the way that we have. And so now we're gonna move on to like our final thing where we're gonna take all the different ideas and concepts and we're going to apply them to an actual image, okay? So I would love it if everybody could start on a new sheet of paper and keep your um, contour line shading techniques next to you. So that way, if you need to reference them, you can. Right. We do have a question. It says, what app do you use to draw on your iPad? Any others that you would recommend? I use Procreate exclusively. Um, it's my favorite because I can draw with a pencil. I can go uh, draw with charcoal, like just real quick. This is a charcoal. It looks and moves and feels like charcoal. I've used all these different mediums. Uh, you know, I know how to... I use pen, I use ink, I use pencil, I've, I've used charcoal, I paint. Um, you can use all of that on this app and it literally moves and feels like the real thing. And so Procreate, if you're interested in getting into uh, non-messy art, Procreate on um, an iPad. I know you can also use it on your phone. Um, that's what I recommend and use. Okay. And don't be, like I said, any questions, ask away. Uh, what pen on Procreate do you use? So for this one specifically, I'm in the sketching section. You can see it's highlighted right there and I'm using the 6B pencil. There's also an HB, a technical, um, the Narinder, Narinder? I don't know how to say it, but I use the 6B just because it gives me uh, a nice level of darkness. Um, I can get it with HB too, but I just have to press down a lot harder and quicker. Um, and I wanna make sure that everybody sees what I'm doing um, in a quick way. And so the 6B is nice because as soon as I start pressing down, I'm getting darkness. But most people like your standard number two pencil, that is an HB pencil. Okay. Now, here's what I would love everybody to do. We're gonna draw a cupcake. And so I don't care who you are, cupcakes are great. They're fun. It's a great visual. And so if you don't know how to draw a cupcake, I'm gonna draw a cupcake. You can totally follow along with me. Um, and then we're going to shade that cupcake, okay? So what I would like everybody, and you don't have to draw this super big because the bigger that you draw it, the more shading you're gonna have to do. And I wanna make sure that you can get this done. No, oh, one more question. Um, I yeah. Someone was, uh, what are you holding in your hand as opposed to like what pencil you use on the app? Oh, okay, so this is, it's an Apple pencil. And so it's, it's like a fancy stylus that I use and uh, it, it's literally like a little pencil uh, without lead in it. And so it just connects with my, uh, my iPad and yeah, I'm able to just draw right on it. It's very, um, it's great because it still feels like a real pencil or pen, but it's all in one area. I hope that I answered it. Okay. So what I would love you to do if you don't know how to draw a cupcake is we're gonna start with our cupcake wrapper. All right, and that's really just straight lines with a little bit of a curved top and bottom. As you can see, my hand kind of wiggled on that bottom line. Totally okay. And then we're just gonna draw some lines and they're not curved. We're going top to bottom to be those creases in that cupcake holder. Now, my cupcake is gonna be a little bit uh, squat. Um, if you drew yours a little taller, thinner, 
doesn't matter. Cupcakes are like people, different shapes and sizes. Doesn't have to be exactly like mine. Okay. Now, the next thing that we're going to do, I love a big puffy cupcake top. And so I'm starting at the top and I'm kind of doing like this flowy cloud motion almost. Um, you don't have to have as many curves or lines if you don't want to. So we're going to do a nice little top. Your top can be simply, I'm going to erase this just for a second. Okay, if you want, yours can just be a dome. There's no wrong way to do it. But mine is going to be that nice kind of, kind of top. And then if you want decorations, um, I always, I don't necessarily love cherries on them, but I love the visual of a cherry on top. It feels like I did it. And if you want sprinkles, that's just little thin rectangles. So don't be afraid to throw a couple sprinkles on there if you want, or if you want to get fancy with your sprinkles. I know star sprinkles, circle sprinkles, whatever you want to do. This is your imaginary sweet treat. Then, because we've obviously been practicing the circles with the shadow behind them, I want to cement this cupcake in reality. And so what we're gonna do is we're going to draw a line behind the cupcake. And that line is going to indicate that this cupcake is now sitting on a counter, okay? Then, what we're gonna do, I, I wanted to pick a shape that wasn't too far away from what we were practicing with, which were circles. And if we look at this, it's still pretty circular. You know, I, we're not shading a, you know, a, a VHS tape box. I don't know why that popped into my head, but it did. Um, but we really wanna look at the shape of this cupcake for when we're shading it. And it's important and I'll show you why. I'm going to go back again, just for consistency, and put that sun up top. Now, it doesn't always have to be a sun. That could, that could also be um, a kitchen spotlight, spotlight, uh, light in a kitchen, or it could be a lamp in the house. You know, like if these are out on a plate, you know, just, just hoping the cat doesn't get them or knock them off. Whatever you wanna do, the sun is just there as a visual, for you to remember like, okay, there is a light source. We know that we're gonna have lights and darks on this cupcake. You can use any single one of the shading techniques that we've talked about. It's totally up to you, whatever you're most comfortable with. But what we're gonna do is put some, put some shading on this cupcake. Now we're not gonna cover the whole cupcake to the point that we can't recognize it anymore. I want you to be really gentle with your pressure when you're applying your shading. And so for mine, I'm going to do some cross hatching. So I'm going to start up here on the cherry. And I don't know if you added a cherry. If you didn't, you're free to watch me um, just kind of throw some in. All right. And so I've just got like a little bit of a shadow and some light shading on that cherry. All right. I'm going to make that bottom left darker. And so that already gives that a little bit of room in the realm of reality. Over here on my cupcake top. Now we know that cupcakes aren't super dark, right? They're usually pretty light pastel -y. Um, I'm going back and forth with my hatching. You don't have to get super dark with it. Because again, we don't want to lose the details of our cupcake. And so I'm just going up and down. It doesn't have to be practically black but it can get a little dark over there. Because remember, we don't want to lose the shape of what we've done. You can get darker along the edge and near the base of the top of this cupcake. And it's okay to go over some of the sprinkles if you added them, but you just want to make sure that you can still read that this is a cupcake that just so happens to have some shading on it. And sometimes it helps um, coloring in your sprinkles. And so if you really want to make sure you can see them, you can just go in there and darken them. Or maybe every other one's colored. I don't know. You can leave a couple not colored, some of them. Either way, there's no wrong way to do this. 
All right. And so, like I said, we're not going super, super dark with it, but we are definitely making sure that there is some darkness. And you don't have to stay exactly in it either. Some of these lines, I'm kind of going over the edge. That's okay. All right, so just like a little bit of shading in there. And then we're gonna do the same thing down here on the base. But we know that the bottom of that base It's the opposite of where the light is. And so we're definitely gonna get a little dark down there, but really just that bottom left corner. And we'll also have a shadow there. And so take your time with it, you know, eyeball it, see what looks good to you. And if you want to go a little darker on the side, I'm doing it just so you can see what that looks like. You can. If you're losing the lines in your cupcake um, folder, the folder, the, the home of the cupcake base <laughs> that's escaping me, um, you can always go in there and darken those lines. So that way you are still keeping that form and that shape without completely losing it with your shading. And that's totally fine. Now, one of the other really cool things that you can do that I didn't mention before, because I want to show you the impact of it here. Um, but if you do this and you did do a cherry, please make sure that you draw another line. And I'm going to do that again on the outside of the stem. So it's a 3D stem. And you'll see why in just a second. So as you're finishing up, um, your shading, you can always very lightly, and I'm doing it very lightly, I'm going back and forth on the counter, to give that counter just a little bit of color, right? Because if this is going to be real and exist in the reality of the world, then that counter might have a little bit of a texture to it. So I just very lightly went back and forth with my pencil just to give it a little bit of color. And then the really cool thing that you can do, and everybody can do this, that's, that makes it even more exciting because it's not hard at all, is you can go all around the, this back area. So anything like where we drew our line, that line up, you color it as dark as you possibly can. And you're like, whoa, wait a minute, we didn't talk about this. What are we doing? And I am so glad you were wondering, because when we do anything and we want it to be rooted in reality, if you are drawing something that has lights, darks, a shadow on the ground, a countertop, anything like that, by going in and coloring super dark, and I mean, I'm talking as hard as it can go, without ripping your paper. Although that will happen sometimes, don't worry about it. We all do it, it's totally fine. Um, you wanna press as hard as you can because by doing that, you are actually giving this a background. And you're like, okay, well, that's really obvious. But what's not really the most obvious thing is that by going as dark as you can like this around an object while having a shadow on the countertop or the ground, whatever it is, I'm just calling it a countertop because I can't imagine a cupcake sitting on the ground unscathed, is that we are making this look as if it is forward in this reality. Because darkness, whenever we add darkness to something, darkness pushes the eye back. Shadows recede, shadows go away from us. You know, if you're in a dark room, everything looks very long and far. And so by adding in a super dark background, like what I'm doing, and I'm doing it very quickly, so that way you can see the uh, impact of this slight illusion, that darkness pushes the cupcake forward. It makes this cupcake look as if it's not only something that exists in the world, but it's on a countertop in front of you with this darkness falling back. 
And it's a really wonderful way to do something and present it to someone, you know, if you want to, you can do art for yourself. But if someone were to come by and see this, they'd say, wow, that's a really great looking cupcake. And that's because you're tricking the eye into looking as if this is a 3D object sitting on a surface where we've looked at light and shadow and we've created values with our shading, the contour lines that you didn't even realize that you were doing by shading around the object and the way that we decided to give this a counter and details on a cupcake without losing them. And so all of this tied together, obviously having those techniques, the shading techniques under your belt, you were able to create a complete and total image that utilizes a lot of different ideas and techniques all at once. And you did this in one hour. So I know there's so much that we could talk about and do, but when I put, put this class together, I really wanted to think, what can I do to show someone something that'll make a really big impact right away? And to me, it's this, it's combining all these different ideas into one to where you actually utilize those ideas with this cupcake. And no matter what, I'll tell you what, all of us that are in here, there's 27 of us, every single one of us are cupcake and are seeing this picture, it's gonna look different. And that's really the best thing about it. Because when you sit down and make art, the way that you hold a pencil, the way that you apply your marks or strokes, it's like handwriting. You know, you don't think about how you write your name or write a sentence on a piece of paper, you just do it. And so the way that your cupcake came out, you're not thinking about it, you just did it. And if you are thinking about it, don't overthink it because I think that's one of the neatest things is that 27 people could come together and draw. And each one of you will have something slightly different in front of you, but all under the same technique umbrella, so to speak. And that is you can draw this. And I hope you did. And I hope you enjoyed it. Well, uh, someone just asked, my four-year-old son was wondering if you were doing another class soon because he loved this. <laughs> my heart. <laughs> I, well, I, you know, no pressure, but I would, I, you know, if you ever do want to do this again, I would absolutely love it. Um, we can always take techniques that we've learned and expand on them. You know, I also really love to draw um, animals are a fun one because you get to work on different textures and can we do cats there. Uh, I, listen, I'm a cat person. So I would absolutely like I, I love to draw like a cat, a dog. I also really love to draw tigers. Tigers are a fun one to draw with the group because those get pretty fun too. Um, so yeah, I you know, I know you like cats, but I would be down to do a cat for yeah. sure. So I thank you so much. I'm so happy to hear that. I mean, that's what this is all about. I think that getting people in touch with the joy of drawing and just setting aside some you time to do something for fun. You know, I think especially lately people have gotten away from that and it's 2022. Take back that that time for you and and make some joy. Draw yourself a cupcake. Enjoy it. Um, someone asked, how can we find you? Do you have a website or other classes that you can um, offer online or do you offer other classes online? Sorry. Yeah, you can. So I, I'm very active on social media, but if you want to um, get a hold of me, I can tell you some different things that I'm doing. Um, and, you know, Liz, maybe uh, you could, I don't know if you do a follow up um, or give people information, but I'm totally okay with people having my email, which is just okay. my first and last name. Um, at gmail.com. And again, yeah, I would, you know, no pressure, but I'd love to come back if, if this was something that was a hit. It um, absolutely was. <laughs> okay, awesome. So this is the most people that I've worked with in one of these classes in a really long time. A lot of people just don't show up. Um, it ends up just being a couple people, which is still fine. But I think, uh, you know, eagerness is a really big part of this. And so if you come into this with a really great attitude, and you're open to these different ideas and concepts, I think it can go, um, I, th I think it works well for everybody involved. Like you said, enthusiasm is a really big part of it. And I definitely try to be that and encouraging too, because that's also super important to me. Someone said that they did this along with their grandson and they, um, they texted the drawings on their messages back and forth. That was my grandma. That is so- Oh, my grandma. 
<laughs> so that was my grandpa. That was my grandpa. <laughs> That's so cool. Oh my gosh. I'm, I'm seriously beaming. <laughs> All right. Well, um, we'll see, Grandpa. We're seeing a lot of thank yous in the chat. So I think we will definitely have Chelsea back uh, at some point in this year. I'd love it. I really would. Absolutely. And if, I don't know if people send, usually send things in, but if they do and you want to share them with me, or if anybody wants to take my email down and send me their drawing, I'd love to see it. Um, I will always be encouraging and supportive. I think it's one of the most important things when it comes to creation. Um, not enough people have support in that. And so I am more than happy to be a source of um, support and encouragement. So thank you. I, I'm just so excited. I'm seriously thrilled that everybody came out to draw today. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming. I'm just going to stop the recording. Okay. <laughs>